Um, all right. Well, I'm so pleased to be joined today uh, with, um, uh, and I wanna get all of her titles right, uh, <laughs> with the very Reverend Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, um, who is the Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary, uh, the Bill and Judith Moyers Chair, and yes, that Bill Moyers Chair in Theology at Union Theological Seminary, um, a, the Canon Theologian at Washington National Cathedral, and the theologian in residence at Trinity Church Wall Street. And what else she does, who knows, because that is an incredible list of, no. of, uh, uh, of great places to be. So um, uh, Dean Douglas, when, when uh, I taught a course uh, uh, about six, eight months ago now Mm -hmm. uh, on uh, uh, the relationship between democracy and Christianity in the US. And we had some really, really good readings as part of that graduate level course. But the book that stood out to our students uh, that we read was Stand Your Ground, mm -hmm. Black Bodies and the Justice of God. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the, it was the book that kind of brought, I mean, it was so, sort of a I don't want to say a conversion experience, but it was pretty close as far as people really had to turn and 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 deal with um, uh, what you, what uh, uh, Dean Douglas did in this book. Um, it is really a great read, and I highly recommend it to everyone. Mm. If you want to understand the power and influence of American exceptionalism and Manifest Destiny, is the grounding narrative. Uh, to stand your ground culture uh, and um, uh, white ex kind of white exceptionalism uh, and and why it is that uh, um, uh, there's connections still between our Anglo-Saxon supremacist origins and uh, and what of course you deal with some in the book, which is the uh, Trayvon Martin's murder and the reflections upon that and all of that kind of stand your ground as three white people belong here, but uh, white America still didn't quite know what to do with black people. Uh, and with the dual narratives that have been set up and all of that. And before I ask my question, uh, kind of question the class of you, I just want to take a couple of uh, brief paragraphs out of your book. Um, uh, there's a lot of good historical work in this, and then there's the constructive work, constructive theological work at the end. Um, and where kind of a summary of where a lot of this has gone is when uh, uh, Dean Douglas writes, some 150 years later, our nation is still a nation divided by war. And as we're approaching this election, oh my gosh, yep. all the more so. It is divided by a stand your ground culture war. It cannot be said enough that such a war will reinvent itself throughout history until the original sin of America's Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism is forthrightly addressed and eliminated. The salvation of the nation depends upon it. The manifestation of the salvation will be nothing less than the justice of God. Mm. And then one, uh, one great quote, so many great quotes in here from James Baldwin. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. Um, you did I mean really, and, and, and I know uh, 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 Eddie Glaudy has, has, you know, has a new book out on, on Baldwin also, and I am looking very much forward to reading that. But when Baldwin said, you said, Baldwin put it bluntly, one wishes that Americans, white Americans, would read for their own sakes this record of Manifest Destiny, American Exceptionalism and the like, and stop defending themselves against it. Only then will they be enabled to change their lives. The fact that they have not yet been able to do this, to face their history, to change their lives, hideously menaces this country. Indeed, it menaces the entire world. And if I were to sum up what I think is at stake in this election. That's right. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a great line. So I, I, our question we've been dealing with in class is, what can people of faith do to help regenerate democracy in the US so that it is the country that we need moving forward and not simply repeating as you so I think you're absolutely right, keep recycling uh, the Anglo-Saxon supremacist narrative until we really deal with it. So really love to hear your thoughts on this matter. Well, first of all, thank you so much 
for inviting me to be a part of this conversation. Thank you for the work that you do and the work that you're doing. And I really mean that with these conversations because that's the beginning. We have to begin to have these conversations and, mm -hmm. and, and white America has to begin to have these conversations and to look deeply into what it means, right? To, mm -hmm. to be white in America. James Baldwin mm -hmm. also says, you know, he says that, uh, You've got to ask white Americans have to ask what's the price of the ticket for being white in America right. Uh, right. To, to begin to ask that question. So I thank you for not only inviting me to be a part of this conversation with you, but for having these conversations. Thanks. When you ask and it's so, you know, here we are and we're, of course, we're taping this a week, uh, just shy of a week before this election. And in so many respects, we could just take what's written there and, uh, and, and it helps us to understand where we are right now yes. in this country and this division. And I'll say something about that in a minute, but I think as the people of faith, here's what we have to understand, I think about where we are in our nation. To be sure, our nation was grounded in this foundation of white supremacy. Uh, and when I talk about American and Anglo-Saxon exceptionalism, that's what we're talking about, this white supremacist foundation <laughs> that in effect said that uh, people who were raised white uh, were superior uh, to all others and that those people uh, in their superiority had the right to dominate and to rule and to subjugate. And we've developed these systems and structures and our way of life is a way of life that is shaped uh, by this white supremacist narrative on all levels. So, but here's, here's the thing that's also uh, paradoxical and mm -hmm. very telling of our nation that even as much as it is steeped in this white supremacist foundation and narrative, it also gave birth to a vision mm -hmm. for a different kind of democracy, if you will, mm -hmm. true democracy, mm -hmm. where it said that uh, all people would uh, in fact be respected uh, and their inalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness would uh, be respected, and that this would be a nation for justice and freedom of all. They mm -hmm. gave this nation gave birth to that vision, but that vision has always been corrupted and perverted mm -hmm. and distorted, right, mm -hmm. by this white supremacist uh, foundation narrative. So, the thing is, and and I call this sort of the warring soul of mm -hmm. our nation. And so consequently, our nation has never been able to live into its democratic vision. That vision is an aspirational vision. We've never been a democracy, it's aspirational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The faith community, those who call ourselves people of faith, right? We are accountable to another vision. And that is the vision of God's promise of a just future. This is a just future that is in so many ways, the vision of our democracy is compatible with that vision, a vision where everybody is treated as the sacred children of God that they are mm -hmm. by virtue of the fact that they have breath. And so that everybody should be able to pursue the inalienable God-given rights, right, of justice, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness, which is to live into the fullness of whomever you were created to be. It seems to me that as people of faith, we are not accountable to the way things are. We are not accountable to the sort of compromising realities of, of our nation. We are accountable to God's more just future, to that vision. And so it is Im uh, important for us and it is dependent upon us. We have a moral obligation mm -hmm. 
to call this country for to hold this country rather accountable to its very vision mm -hmm. that's who that's what we have to do we have a moral obligation because this country's even moral imagination has been shaped by a white supremacist narrative we need to hold the country accountable to its vision to for a more just society and reshape the moral imagination and so we can do that because we we have to have we have to bring forth a different imagination for justice and that's god's imagination and how we do that the first thing of course that we have to do is we can't we can't be invisible <laughs> right right we have right to be visible uh on the public square we have to raise our voices we have to call the country to account to its own vision uh uh even as we hold ourselves accountable to uh, this 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 higher vision, we have to tell the truth. We have to be the truth tellers of who this country is and what this country has become. Uh, even as we hold this country to what it uh, uh, has said it wants to be, mm -hmm. uh, and so to me, that's 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 the beginning, and it begins in the recognition of the original sin, which is white supremacy. That is it is held original sin is about being held captive to a culture of sin we are held captive to this culture of sin that is white supremacy that is preventing us from being a democracy mm. yeah i appreciate all of that um uh, one of the things i've started saying is that i think we need to teach his american history in church well uh, yes <laughs> uh, right i mean because i don't know uh, depending on what the public school system is in one's right. area you don't know exactly what's being taught there, but each of our denominations, you're Episcopalian, I'm, I'm United Methodist, we own, we have our own histories with, with racism and, right. and, and, and racism as a system, not just as a, what an individual does. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And I, I don't even care, you know what, this is why I like that we talk about white supremacy. Right, mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter whether on uh, on one level it doesn't matter whether or not people want to say that they're racist or even if they're mm -hmm. anti-racist. Right. Right. That doesn't matter. What matters is this: that what matters is that people who are raised white benefit from a white supremacist system and structure. So that what we whether or not they're white supremacists, I don't care. We have a nation that is ruled by a white supremacist system and structure, and that means people who are raised white benefit from it and people who are not raised white are penalized even unto death by it and so if we can just recognize that recognize this reality of white privilege and the way in which that functions systemically and structurally i don't care if you races or not races uh the, what i do care about is that we are living under and so, and, and are captive to a culture that fosters and nurtures racism that fosters and nurtures white supremacy and it does that that it's not benign, it does right, that right. at the peril of non-white persons. Right, right. And ultimately of all persons. That's that's uh, right. right. Because all because of our humanity, you're so all, right. right. Our humanity is at stake. Right. I mean, the whole the whole biosphere in a way <laughs> is is uh, suffering right now oh, because right. of of other parts that are allied with white supremacy, also. That's exactly right. Right, right. So one of the dilemmas we have uh, in a part of the country which is much more dominated by um, conservative evangelical fundamentalist uh, and all uh, uh, forms of, of faith, much more so than around New York City, um, uh, is, is uh, Christians who don't see systems. Uh, they don't even have a language that allows for systems. It's all about individual choice uh, and the like. Do you ever run into that in your teaching? Oh my, yes, you know, and that is, you're correct to point out, that's an evangelical narrative that focuses on sort of individual sin uh, as opposed to corporate sin that focuses on sort of saving the soul uh, as opposed to uh, those things that kill the body and, you know, the body becomes this sort of as you know, I'm telling you that what you know, 
in this narrative, the body becomes that thing that sort of corrupts the soul, et cetera. And it's that narrative, that kind of individual uh, narrative of sort of private pietistic kind of understanding of sin and reality. It's that narrative that allows for the kind of uh, Christian understanding that indeed legitimated slavery. It's that narrative that gave birth to slaveholding religion. It's that narrative that allows this kind of unjust status quo uh, mm -hmm. to exist. And so you were so right about that. And so how do we begin to break into that narrative to mm -hmm. begin to help people to realize uh, what we're talking about when we talk about sort of the sin that is white supremacy. You know, one of the things that I, I try to do and say all the time, let's then start with the individual, right? Mm -hmm. And let's not start with sort of this understanding of systemic and structural uh, racism, which is white supremacy. Just ask yourself, I, I try to get people to say, okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Let's let's start with the individual. Let's start with the golden rule, but less mm -hmm. what I call sort of the mm -hmm. reverse golden mm -hmm. rule. Mm -hmm. And 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 ask yourself, say what don't do to another or withhold, don't withhold from withhold. another. Mm -hmm. That which you would not want withheld from yourself. Wow. Yeah. Right? If we can start there. If we can look at another human being and see them as a human being and say, you know what? I don't want withheld from them what I would not want withheld from myself. Mm -hmm. Do I want health care? Do I want uh, a decent home, a job opportunities, education, an opportunity to live into the fullness of whomever God created me to be? If you want that for yourself, don't mm -hmm. withhold it from another. And so mm -hmm. I, I think if we can begin at that level, because I, I, I declare that one of the things, you know, we with George, the George Floyd video, when mm -hmm. uh, that was released, we mm -hmm. saw again, a different kind of protest that erupted in this country. And uh, that was a protest of not simply uh, people blessed with Ebony Grace with Black people, but this protest that encompassed a diverse group of protesters, you know, white and, and Black, et cetera. And how did that happen? You saw people having these sort of uh, uh, conversion experiences, if yeah, you will, yeah, yeah. right? And 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 white Americans saying, "Wow, you know, we, you know, we can't. This isn't who we want to be." I think yet, you know, and 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 black people are saying. My own son said to me, "Well, it, my son's twenty seven years old," and he goes, "Why are they just getting it? You know, there was Freddie mm. Gray, there was Michael mm. Brown, there was Trayvon, there was Tamir, there was Sandra Bland, and and, and now all of the sudden." And it seems to me that one of the things that was different about that video, and we've seen all of these videos and no one else has moved, was that George Floyd cried out for his mother. Mm. Mm. Cried out for his mother. Mm. And in fact, I heard a woman, a white woman on CNN say that when she heard him cry for his mama, she couldn't take it. Wow. And because in that moment, he was humanized. He was somebody's son, mm. right? If you can look at another person and say, that is somebody's son, that is somebody's daughter, that is somebody's father, that is somebody's mother. When you can do that, when you can see another human being, then you can say that is a child of God. And when yeah. we can begin yeah. there, then yeah. I think that's the way into helping these people who start in this, this narrative of individual sin. Well, let's start there with the individual and then move out and just say, so, you know, how, how would you want to be treated? And then we can understand how the systems and structures and the way in which this world has shaped doesn't allow for right. somebody else's son or daughter to have what you would want for your son and daughter. Yeah, yeah, it, it has always seemed, well, I could say not always, um, for all of my adult life, it has seemed that um, equality is definitely the junior partner to freedom oh. uh, uh, <laughs> here. And because equality, equality involves 
that kind of uh, mutuality and reciprocity that you're talking about. That's right. Uh, and and I think that we give lip, more lip service to it uh, and uh, to uh, much less than much le much less attention than it needs to have. And I think for for me, democracy moving forward means we got to pay attention to equality in some really significant ways. Oh no, I, I I agree, but we can't get there until we all understand that we are all human beings, right? Yes, and right. one of the things that drives the uh, the narrative of uh, white supremacy and a white supremacist culture is that when you see a George Floyd, you don't see a human being. Right. Uh, right. Uh, you see what this narrative has said that black people are. You see someone that is ready, a monster ready to yeah. erupt at any yeah. time, right. and so you, right. you got to kill him. I, I think of Elijah McClain and Dick Denver, uh, the 19 year old, right? And he's mm -hmm. walking home from the store of getting tea. Uh, isn't this a familiar narrative? Uh, and someone calls because he has a, a hoodie and a mask on or something. And someone calls and says that he looks suspicious and the thing, the police come. And what makes this very slight 19 year old <coughs> look suspicious, but what struck me as in his interaction with the police, he said, you know, uh, I, I don't I don't kill flies. I, I I'm just and he begins to try to humanize himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he said, I'm just different. He's it, it, uh, and so, you know, trying to get them to see that I am not some black monster that's about ready to erupt. You know, I'm just an ordinary, he said, I'm different. He said, I don't kill flies. I don't even kill flies. Trying to get them to see a, that he, another human being, that he's somebody else's son or daughter. And of course they couldn't see that. And, and of course he's now dead. And yeah. so, that, that to me, if we can, when we talk about equality, we have to first begin to see that we are all equal children of God. Right, and if we in the faith community can't get that message across, <laughs> it right. really is time to close up our doors. That's exactly, that, that's right. And that's where, and, and to me, that's the beginning of, of, of the conversation. What has prevented us from seeing those who are different from us, uh, from seeing that they're just like us? Yeah, right. What, what right. that's right. where we have to begin. And what in our churches can we do to make that possible? And I think that's where I think the iconography in our churches, the stories that we tell mm -hmm. in our churches, mm -hmm. you're so right, the history uh, that we must share share uh, in our churches, you know, if we want to help people to see that we all are a reflection of God, then we have to have images of people in our churches that reveal that. We can't have all these white Jesuses in our churches and all of these, uh, this white iconography. Uh, can't have it because then we what we're, we're doing is we are fostering and nurturing a narrative that says that the black body isn't a sacred body, that the black body is, is, uh, is is a body that signals evil. These songs that we sing in our churches, fair, fair Lord Jesus, please need to throw that out. Uh, uh, you know, we really have to, what are the ways in our churches that we are even unwittingly mm -hmm. promoting mm -hmm. this white supremacist narrative yeah. that suggests yeah. that the black body is something other than a sacred body? Yeah. yeah. And with that, I'm going to say thank you very much, uh, because I know your time is, is, is about up. Uh, Dr. Kelly Brown Douglas, a wonderful book. Thank you for the conversation. I really appreciate it. And blessings to all the good things that you're doing and all the places you're doing it. Well, vice versa. Thank you for having me. Thank yeah. you.